I'm Camelia Nimri, a mathematics instructor here at Spokane Community College. And I would like to welcome all of you, the ones who came in person to watch our guest speaker on the big screen. And for those who are watching online, I make sure. Okay, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge the native land or do the native land, land acknowledgement. We are honored to acknowledge that the community colleges of Spokane and our main campuses for Spokane Falls and Spokane Community College are located on the traditional and sacred homelands of the Spokane tribe. We also provide services in a region that includes the traditional and sacred homelands of the Confederated Tribe of the Caldwell Reservation and the Calisco Tribe. We pay our respect to tribal elders, both past and present, as well as to all indigenous people today. This land holds their cultural DNA, and we are honored and grateful to be here on their traditional lands. We give thanks to the legacy of the original people and their descendants and pledge to honor their stewardship and values. Now I would like to introduce our guest speaker. Rifq Ibeid is a Palestinian Muslim mother of three. She has a JD from George Mason University, an MA in Human Rights Studies from Columbia University, and an MA in Speech Language Pathology from the University of Northern Colorado. Rifq has worked extensively in the field of human rights and media advocacy with various international human rights organizations and is currently working as a pediatric speech language pathologist. She is also the author of one of a kind children's book in English about Palestine entitled Baba, what does my name mean? A journey to Palestine. Please help me welcome Rifq Ibed. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. So thank you so much for inviting me to come talk today. I feel very grateful to have this talk specifically with college students because I consider my college experience to be one of the most formative experiences of my life. I was heavily involved in student activism and that really exposed me to so many life lessons and really allowed me to start discovering my strengths and my weaknesses and just my overall understanding of the world around me and what my role was. So I really consider this to be a crucial time in you guys' lives. So the topic that I'm going to talk about today is the power of using your voice and telling your story and sharing your narrative. Because the ability to communicate, and not just to communicate, but to effectively communicate, cannot be understated. It will impact every aspect of your life. So I'm going to rewind a little bit and tell you guys about an experience that I had in high school. It was my senior year and we had to write something called an extended essay and we could pick whatever topic we wanted. I've been told that I've been talking about Palestine since preschool. So naturally, the topic that I chose to research was Palestine and more specifically the first intifada or the first uprising. And at that time, I remember making a conscious decision to educate myself about my history because I knew that strength would come with knowledge. 
and that it wasn't enough to just be a proud Palestinian, but I needed to be well versed on my history and on my narrative. So I'm doing all the research and I'm learning in more and more detail about the injustices and my young brain is fuming. And ironically, at the same time, the second Intifada broke out and I basically became immersed in all things Palestine. It's all I talked about and it's all I thought about. And so <clears throat> what I would do is every morning before school, I would run, in, run outside and get the newspaper and look for any articles that talked about the Intifada. And then I would highlight them and tape them to my car windows. And I also made a list of all the names of martyrs and taped that to my windows. And at that time, when I was in high school, the internet was still something new. So we barely had internet, let alone social media. So this is basically what I had come up with to spread awareness about what was happening. And then one day in biology class, a fellow Arab American who was the only other Arab American in my class heard me talking about Palestine to some other classmates. And he said quite rudely, he said, instead of complaining, why don't you do something about it? I was in shock. And at the time, I didn't necessarily have the language to respond to him. I just knew that what he said was wrong and that it didn't make sense. And now when I look back on it, obviously I know that what he said was wrong because I was doing something about it. Just by me talking about it was me doing something about it because I was educating myself and educating those around me about something they most likely were not aware of and would never hear about otherwise. And if they did hear about it, they were probably going to hear about it from the wrong sources. Because I grew up in a small city in Florida in the South, and I was one of two other Palestinian families, and I was the only Palestinian in my high school. So most of my classmates would probably never meet another Palestinian in their lives. So I had to speak up. And that brings me to the importance of using your voice and recognizing the power of your voice. And when I say use your voice, this can take on so many forms. It doesn't have to be literally you just talking because you have to use your voice in a way that makes you most comfortable and most confident because that's the only way that your message will be properly conveyed. And so using your voice can be done in a variety of ways. You can do it through speaking, through writing, through art, music, dance, photography, social media, podcasting, your clothing, the food you eat, and just in your daily interactions with people around you. We have such a plethora of opportunities to use our voice. And what's really beautiful about this day and age is the almost unlimited amount of access that we have to have our voices heard. So if we fast forward now to my college years, I mentioned that my biggest thing was student activism. And that's the route that I felt most effective in and what really spoke to me. I loved organizing events and just trying to think of creative ways to spread awareness about Palestine. But <clears throat> what I learned along the way, or what I discovered, was that I had developed this phobia of public speaking. And although I stayed a student activist throughout all of my studies, I would find ways to get around having to do a lot of public speaking. And so when I was done with my degrees and out in the real world, I knew deep down that I couldn't really continue the route of traditional activism because to me that involved a lot of visibility and public speaking 
and just things that I didn't feel that I truly thrived in or looked forward to or was comfortable doing. So if we go back to this idea of the power of using our voice, I was in a really tough spot. But I knew that I had something important to say and that I needed to say it. And as a Palestinian, I deeply felt that using my voice was the least I could do. And even then, not enough. But I needed to find a way to do this without hurting my mental health in the process. And so that's how I ended up actually deciding to write this children's book because I thought I could say everything that I want and teach people about our history and then never have to talk. But I was wrong <laughs> because obviously here I am talking. But anyways, um, I like the idea of a book because I also consider it like a sadaqajariya or like an ongoing trust. And honestly, what happened after I published my book was nothing short of incredible to me personally, because I found that people were really thirsty for our narrative, for our voice. And for far too long, we've had people speaking about us, but not people listening to us. And as Palestinians, we've never been silent. We've always been at the forefront of our struggle for justice, but we have been silenced and we have, our voices have been muted. But now we're at a point where we saw last May the role that social media can play in amplifying our voices. So I want you guys to really think about your role as Arab Americans in amplifying your story because only you have that unique understanding of what it is to be an Arab American. Only you will be able to talk about that experience with authenticity. Only you will have these experiences that you went through and these microaggressions that you had to process that you can talk about. Somebody else can't tell that story for you. And so <clears throat> the more we add our voices to the mix, the more we can drown out the wrong voices because we're going to get talked about no matter what. We're constantly stereotyped and discriminated against due to these stereotypes and all the misinformation that clouds people's judgment. So we want us to do the talking, not somebody else. And you never know what impact your words can have on someone on an individual level or on a bigger level. I was listening to this TED talk by Linda Sue Park and she said, can a children's book save the world? No, but the young people who read them can. So I really urge you guys to share your voice with the world because you never know who is listening and benefiting and what that person will do with what they learned from you. So for example, my intentions for my book were actually so specifically geared towards a Palestinian audience that I had no idea how far it would actually reach. I've been approached by a lot of non-Arab, non-Muslim groups seeking out this book. And it's really because the world is shifting and people are thirsty for our truths, for indigenous truths. And through this book, I've been able to continue talking about Palestine in so many different settings. I've been able to talk in academic settings, in conferences, in schools, in libraries and podcasts, this one simple children's book that was just a small idea in my head really opened the door to so many places that I could talk about Palestine in. And to me, that's a win because any opportunity that we create to share and spread our narrative in is a win. And <clears throat> I will be the first to say 
that yes, it is stressful and emotionally and mentally exhausting sharing your trauma with a world that continues to deny it or question it. But when you amplify your voice, you might help other people amplify their own voice. And this does cause a ripple effect because people will feel more confident in knowing that there's strength in numbers and that they will have or they will be able to find support. And, you know, as Arab Americans, we're obviously not a monolith. So when I, when I say use your voice, it doesn't mean that you are the voice of the group. It just means you're one of many. So the more of our voices and our experiences that we put out there, the more the world can see just how diverse we are. Authentic representation has far reaching impacts on everybody involved. So making our voices heard and telling our stories is a very powerful way to change the stereotypes and the Orientalist depictions of who we are as Arabs. And what I find most motivating now for me is that when I use my voice, my children will be watching and listening and hopefully they will be able to see themselves represented more than I was as a kid. And they will be able to value their stories and see that other people share their experiences and hopefully in turn build their sense of self and their, their confidence in their identity. It's not the most pleasant feeling in the world to be the token Arab. And I know that nobody wants to bear the responsibility of representing their entire culture or background. But at the end of the day, if you don't do it, somebody else, the wrong somebody else will do it for you. We can't live our lives as passive spectators. We really have to be active players and contributors to our world. We have to be the change makers. And the only way to do so is to start by using our voice. So something that I want to leave you guys with today is before you leave this room, I really want you guys to try and identify what unique skills and talents you have and then how you can creatively use those unique skills and talents to share your voice with the world. Thank you. And I don't know, are we gonna do Q and A? I can't hear. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't sure that um, your presentation was going to be short. I was hoping to save some questions for later, but now we have more time for questions. So I have an issue, a little bit of an issue with the technology because I can see the chat on this computer because we're dealing with people who are present in the room and people who are watching on YouTube live and those chats come through my other computer so we'll, we'll figure it out. However, I'm going to ask if the audience have any questions first here until we figure out this, the questions coming from the, from the chat. Okay. Do you have any questions for Riff that we can ask? Yes, please. 
So how is she planning to continue? New generation. Okay. Okay, so Riff, um, the question is, what are your plans? How are you planning to continue with the traditions to go on for generations to um, to connect with the new generation so they can keep your... Um... That's a really great question. So one of that's one of the goals that I had for my first book is by sharing different aspects of Palestinian culture and history so that my kids and other kids who are reading it can see what a rich history we have and so that they can understand that whatever is happening right now in Palestine is just one small part of their history because you know our history is at 4,000 years old. Zionism is gonna be one small part of it. And so I really do my best to share, um, you know, knowledge about our history, but also about our culture. And with, with my kids personally, I do that in, I like to do it in an organic way. So I like it to be a natural part of who they are. I put a lot of books around the house. I have a lot of pictures. Um, we cook Arabic food. We speak in Arabic to each other. Um, I'm always talking about Palestine with them. I'm sharing videos with them. I mean, luckily we have, again, the, the access. So we have so much access to YouTube videos and all kinds of stuff where they can really feel like they are in Palestine as well. So I always encourage parents to have your kids exposed in a very natural way. And you can do that again through food, language, books, um, family stories, sharing your family stories, um, different art projects, clothing, all kinds of fun ways that you can keep them connected to their culture. And, it, and the most important thing is really sharing the stories with your kids and connecting it. Like, why is it important for me to learn Arabic? Why is it important for me to understand what our foods are or our cultural dress or any cultural symbols or anything like that. Just doing a lot of talking and explaining and having it always around so that it becomes a natural part of their identity. Thank you. I have a question myself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, since this week is the National um, <clears throat> read, read Across America Week, so it's really fair to um, ask you to just talk about your children's book that you authored. Could you like read some, a part of it, some experts, excerpts uh, yeah. of it, or... <laughs> Um, I can, yes, if I can, I can try and pull it up on my screen. I could even try and screen share. I don't know. Does that work on this? Would that work if, if I screen share sure. it? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, sorry. I totally, um, forgot to bring the actual book with me. So I don't have the physical copy, but I'm going to grab um, the book. But in the meantime, I'll tell you guys the way that the book is set up, it's kind of like a travel guide throughout Palestine so that whoever's reading it will feel like they got to visit Palestine because and I mentioned this in my talk, I felt like, or I feel like a lot of Palestinians grow up 
feeling very proud to be Palestinian, but we don't know, we're not taught much else like in detail about the, the land and the geography and, and different um, historical things that the cities were known for. So that's what I really tried to share in my book. And um, so she goes to on a journey through nine different cities and gets to know what each city was known for. And then in the end, she's left feeling hopeful because she has all this knowledge now. So she feels powerful and like she can go spread that knowledge to other people. Because my hope was that if you plant the seed now in the kids, it will give them that foundation that they need to keep learning so that when the time comes, when the topic does come up, they will feel equipped to talk about their homeland and they'll feel strong and they won't be stressed out by anything that they hear. Because I know for myself, when I got to college and I started hearing all of the um, lies and propaganda about us, it was really hard for me to respond. And I had to do a lot of work researching and learning. So those were my, my small humble goals for this book. But let me see if I can screen share. Here we go. And I'll just read kind of like the beginning and the end. Okay, is that, is that showing up? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna make it big. Okay. So it's called Baba, What Does My Name Mean? A Journey to Palestine. My friends at school asked me what my name meant today. I proudly proclaimed it was an Arabic name, but then I didn't know what else to say. When Baba tucked me into bed that night, I asked him, Baba, what does my name mean? What Baba said next was like a gust of wind that propelled me into a magical dream. Samida is an Arabic word for one who is patient, persistent, and one who perseveres. One who will fight for their rights without any fear. We named you this because you are a Palestinian. Your name carries the weight of a nation beloved to millions. The historic land of Palestine is a wonder to behold, and I think now is the perfect time for its story to be told. You will first need this key from my necklace, your right to return to your ancestors' homes. You must treat it like gold. Now close your eyes and imagine with me. Do you see a white dove perched over there on a majestic olive tree? Her name is Salam, the dove of peace. You will fly with her on tonight's journey. Ahlan wa sahlan, Samida. I'm delighted to take you across mountains, hills, deserts, and plains, all part of Palestine's unique terrain. So then they start on their journey and they go first to Ariha and then Al Quds and then Nablus, Yaffa. Haifa, Akka, Gaza, Beit Lahem, and Al Khalil. And then at the end, it says, Our journey has now come to an end. So I want to leave you with the symbol of Palestine as my final surprise a superhero kufiya cape that you can wear with pride. I also want you to have this hand-stitched Palestinian thobe or dress. The design and style are unique to Yaffa, your hometown from which you were dispossessed. Salam, I know what my superhero power will be. I will fly all around the world and open people's minds using my key. I will unlock all the truths about Palestine and educate everyone about its true history. Through persistence and perseverance, I know one day we will be free. When I opened my eyes, I excitedly exclaimed to Baba, I love Palestine. Yes, Habibti, I know, he sighed. Isn't it divine? My homeland is so heavenly, 
Why must I yearn for it? That is why we named you Samida, my love, because one day you will return to it. Inshallah, Baba, as soon as can be. But until then, can you tell me what made me a refugee? Baba took a deep breath and smiled softly. Let's save that conversation for tomorrow's bedtime story. And then I explain here in the back that I used the Arabic names for our cities because as you see here, I put it's vitally important in our quest for justice, resistance to colonization and the maintenance of our identity and our indigenous roots in the land. So, I mean, I'm sure people know that Israel has been changing the names of all of our cities and villages that, that remain, not including the ones they've destroyed. Um, but that's why it's really important for us to continue using the original Arabic names so that it doesn't get lost throughout the generations. And then I have some discussion questions in the back to help parents or teachers kind of guide a discussion after reading the story. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? Well, I um, don't think we have questions, not that I can see from online. However, I like to ask one more question. Um, I know you're a first generation Arab American. My children are first generation Arab Americans. And I believe your parents immigrated to the States at the same time as I did. And I'm always interested in when we raised our children, it was so challenging that we're trying to fit in, we're trying to you know, raise our children the best we can. However, we were always not sure every day that we made the right decisions, you know, like, and when, when I immigrated, that was a long time ago, there was no internet or anything like that, no social media. People didn't know anything um, about, you know, um, the culture of like we came just like blind people to America. <laughs> we didn't know much <laughs> at the time. But then every single day and sometimes every single moment, you have to make that decision to, you know, for your children to help them be the best they can, yet not to lose your culture and adapt, you know. Mm -hmm. um, adapt to another culture totally. You want them to hold on to the good values that we have in our culture. And I know sometimes we, you know, we wake up and we <laughs> lose sleep over whether we made the right decision or not. And, you know, I'm proud to say that my children turned out to be wonderful like you are. <laughs> you have turned out to be wonderful. And so now I have the answer after so many years. Um, so I know just try your best and you, you know, you never fail. However, it's always interesting to ask a first generation Arab American about experiences when they were growing up because of this difference in culture that your parents were trying to hold on to. And sometimes it could be a funny thing. Sometimes it could be, you know, a story that you'll always remember what happened. Why did your parents do that? You know, and so I, if you can elaborate on, on this being raised in, you know, as with, with um, immigrants. Oh, it's such an interesting topic. And now that I'm a parent, I see it, I, I don't know, I see it in both ways, like as a kid, but now as a parent. So I have like two different experiences with this. But I will say it's 
like you said, it's hard to know if, if what you're doing is, is going to work and you can, you'll be the same parent, but you'll have two kids that turn out totally different, even though you did the same parenting. So I might be super gung ho about being Palestinian, but my sibling might be, eh, it's great. It's just, it is what it is and move on. So everybody has like different, everybody processes it differently. So I, I won't say that there's one specific thing parents can do. I think there's things that they can do, but at the end, it's really just how your child ends up processing it. But I will say, I know from my experience, my parents, um, again, just always exposed us to Palestine. And like you said, at the time when, when they came, you have limited media access. Um, you can barely talk on the phone back home and you were really isolated. And so I know that a lot of Arabs clung to their communities. And what's funny is in our situation, I grew up in this small city in Florida, which I'm living back in, in again, <laughs> but it was very um, isolating. And the, the Arab community was very small. We have like a decent sized Muslim community. Majority of the Arabs are, I think from Syria. So again, one of two Palestinian families um, but it was a, just a very small community. So I didn't ever feel like I had that, that Arab community that I longed for. But my parents always had it within the home. So I, I had all these exposures to books and our food and just them talking and always listening to the news, always talking about the news. And also, what I think helped a lot is I really liked Arabic music. That really help, helped keep me connected and, and even learn the language better. And we also were lucky enough to be able to visit Palestine every summer. And I think that's what really helped me because if I think about childhood memories, I don't remember anything in the States. I only remember our summers in Palestine as my childhood memories. So I really um, felt this visceral connection and I always felt this struggle between both worlds as well because although I felt very Palestinian, when I was in Palestine, I felt very American. <laughs> so I used to tell my parents like, oh, this is so hard. Can I just have an island where I can live by myself with other Arab Americans? They'll get it. It was really tough. And honestly, until now, I really struggle with it because, you know, my whole educational path was in pursuit of fighting for Palestine. And I felt like if I picked anything else outside of what I thought I had to do, I felt like I'd be cheating on it. And I'm just now getting to the point where I'm accepting. You just have to get to this point where you accept that you are Arab American. You're going to have both worlds within you. And you ha just have to find a way to, to, to be that. I will never be fully Palestinian, like where I, I know the culture inside out and it's, and I will never be fully American. I'm just a mix. And I just have to get to a point where I'm okay with that. And I accept it as it is. And as a parent, I really stress out a lot about my kids. And um, I, I hope and I pray that they feel as connected to their homeland. Uh, and the only thing, like you said, the only thing we can do is the best that we can. And to me, that's the exposure and the education and the rest is not in my hands. So I can do my part and make sure I do it well. And I hope that when they see like, oh, my mom wrote a book about Palestine. Oh, my mom is talking about Palestine. Oh, da -da. I hope that they develop this internal connection to it as well, even if we're unable to visit every summer. 
So I don't know if that answered your question. It's a really hard topic. <laughs> to yes, ask. yes. Yeah. It's, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm still watching the chat online and I don't have any questions. So anyone from the audience have any questions for Rev? I was really hoping for everybody, like for this to be like a dialogue because I really want to encourage people to really think about something creative that they can do that works for them. I never ever thought of writing a children's book. This came way late, later on through, and I think it's like a culmination of all of my experiences up until that point. So just really try and expand your mind and think about all the possibilities and all the creative spaces that we can share our voices in and, and really consider being proactive and taking baby steps to make something happen. This for my book, it just started as an idea in my head. I never thought I would publish it. I never thought I would finish it. Because I had two babies in the process. But if you have like this burning passion or something you you want to tell or something you want to say, find a way to do it in spite of yourself, in spite of any obstacles that you face. Great. Thank you. So is your book available at libraries or is it, or if someone is interested to get your book, how do they? It's available on any online platform and you can ask for your local library to acquire it. Um, I'm, it's available right now until what day are we, March 2nd? It will be available until March 6th. And then I'm gonna have a little gap because I'm changing my distribution. Um, but right now it's a bit available online for the next few days. <laughs> great, great. Well, I think um, if you like something else to share with us in the next few minutes, because I don't think we have any questions but we always like to, like, do you have a story that's funny associated with you as being a first generation American? Does something come to mind like that? That's interesting because I know I, oh, there's a question there. I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> okay, <The> question. <laughs> Saved by the question. <laughs> well, we can get back to it. Okay. Yeah, I just came here late, actually, but I know for sure you're uh, Palestinian. So I was wondering, it's like actually similar with uh, Ms. Camellia's question. So I would like to know what was the uh, difficulty with the cultural gap between Palestine and America that you experienced or noticed or that made you, made you confused from the when you experienced this kind of thing? So I don't know if it made me confused, but it's just, you don't feel internally like you belong fully in either or. So definitely a language barrier. I speak Arabic, but it's on a basic level. Like I can't have, if I wanted to have a deep conversation about life, it would be more challenging for me. So once I got older, I definitely felt like the language barrier caused an issue for me because I didn't feel like I could express myself in the way that I that I knew I, I could internally. I couldn't express it with my Arabic speaking family. Um, so language creates an issue. And then, I mean, in the US, we're, these are like small examples, but like in the US, we're very direct and overseas, not to stereotype, but we're not very direct. There's a lot of going, dancing around a subject instead of just going straight to it. So I learned that the hard way because apparently I was very direct <laughs> whenever I would visit. So you have to kind of adjust um, the way that you're used to talking so that 
it doesn't step on people's toes or rub them the wrong way, you know? Um, and then in the U S I mean, that's like on a whole other level. I mean, here again, I live in a small city in the South. Um, you're just looked at as an alien. I mean, nothing that I do, no accomplishment I have will change that because I've had so many experiences and microaggressions that really like take a toll on you and it makes it hard for you to fully immerse yourself because you know that this person either thinks they're better than you or they look at you like you're weird or different or somehow less than and it's just so hard to to be familiar with the world and then have to deal with people that are not familiar with anything but their small community. Like they have no worldly thinking and understanding of history and of cultures and, and how to appreciate and celebrate other cultures. So it makes it really hard on that level to, to fully interact like and to be yourself. And also I feel like if I'm myself, it's always going to be, oh, that Palestinian girl did that. So that must mean all Palestinians do that. So it's kind of like that type of back and forth that you feel. So you can't, you don't feel like you can ever really be yourself in any situation. I totally understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So I just wanna let you know that you know, the Arab Culture Club, we had many st students of multiple nationalities, different nationalities, and some of them are immigrants, some of them are Arabs, and some are Americans, and so it's a mix of students. So I'm sure that many of them have connected with you today, and, um, you know, we have discussions, of course, in the future about it, but I'm so glad that you joined us today, and I'm thankful for, you know, the experiences that we're going to remember about this and, um, you know, about the book and about Palestine. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm so thankful. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys come up with. Maybe you can create something as a group together. It would be really such a wonderful experience to come up with something tangible together that you can put out into your college or into your community. Right, right. And I know my students who are taking online classes are, they have an assignment to do about this today. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I know there's some other people who will be discussing this and talking about it. And you guys can find me on social media. I'm active on Instagram. So anytime you want to ask any questions or if you're, you need advice or anything that I can help with, I'm always happy to, to help. We appreciate that. Thank you so much, Rift. Please give a hand to our guest speaker, Rift. Thank you. Thank you.